you for an, um, announcements. Yes. Uh, a couple of announcements. So, um, just a reminder is that if we have the fundraiser for Labor Day retreat this Saturday at 9 a.m. to 2 p.m. and then go back. Go back. Oh yeah. So we have a yard sale, bake sale, and also a car wash. Um, the adults. Um, I wanted to sponsor help with our fundraiser by giving us or making us egg rolls and wontons to sell. And also, if you have anything to bring, um, you can bring it on Friday at 6 p.m. for the yard sale or any other supplies. Um, and also for Labor Day retreat. Next. Next slide, please. Yes, it is um, September 2nd to the 4th. And Currently, we have a total of 38 people coming from our church that are representing Val Liberty, which is the most, um, and also uh, registration is $85, and then if you want it with a shirt, with a bundle, it will be 110 since the shirt is $25. All right, so we mm -hmm. want to make note, too, the fundraising is mainly going to cost the, uh, cover the the, the $85, yes. Yes. Mm -hmm. but not the shirt. So just want to keep that in mind. Mm -hmm. And then next. Oh, it's also for the tidings. If you would like to give, um, just text give and that phone number right there and follow the directions that we've given to you. Next. Oh, yeah. And then also, if you have Cash App, you can um, scan our QR code and then you can help contribute to our youth. Also, we have uh, Brother Lennon for praise and worship in the um, lesson. Okay, if everyone please just come and let's praise the Lord together and stand together. Mm -hmm. So. Come thou fount of every blessing to my heart to sing thy grace. Streams of mercy never ceasing cause for songs of loudest praise. Teach me some melodious sonnet sung by flaming tongues of love. Praise the mountain, fix upon it, mount a flat unchanging love. Come thou fount, come thou fount of every blessing to my heart to sing thy grace. Streams of mercy never ceasing. Cause for songs of loudest praise. Teach me some melodies, song in song by many times of love. Praise the mountain, fix upon it, mount of God's unchanging love. my strength when I am weak. You are the treasure that I seek. You are my all in all. Seeking you as a precious jewel. Lord, to give up, I'll be a fool. You are my all in all. Taking my sin, my cross, my shame, rising again, I bless your name. 
Let's pray. Gracious Father, we thank you for today. Thank you for allowing us to come here to sing your praise, to, to come together as a, as a church, to learn your word. I pray that you speak to me, that your words will, um, will, will be in my heart and, and allow me to do my best to convey your words for tonight, Father, and what you want us to learn uh, in our continued study out of 1 John. And so I just want to uplift everybody that couldn't make it. We want to uplift uh, uh, Brother Chance as he's uh, making his way to Colorado for the weekend. Uh, bless his trip there, and along with the other fellow brothers and sisters in the Leaf uh, community, just to bless their time in the, in the retreat. Um, continue to be with us as we prepare for our fundraiser for the youth, as we uh, try to make an effort to raise as much funds as we can for, for Labor Day, and just, just want to lift this up to you in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. Okay, so if you have your Bibles, please turn with me to 1 John chapter 5, uh, verses 1 to 5. That is going to be our main focus today, uh, tonight, for, for our scripture reading tonight. And so, for all of us who uh, continue to commit their time to come every Wednesday, we thank you as just, uh, um, as we appreciate your support um, and continuing just to keep the Wednesday, Wednesday ministry uh, going. And so, but for those who haven't been here on the Wednesday night ministries, we've been uh, diving into the, the book of First John, which reminds us as Christians at times when we feel doubt that, that in the book of First John, that we can overcome those doubts by what's been written in here. And so, uh, before we get into scripture, I just want to go with, through an overview with you of what we can expect and what the writer of First John chapter 5 intended for uh, this chapter uh, uh, for us to understand how, how it's going to be understood. So, the, the main idea... If you go to the next slide, the true Christians will display evidence of being God's children, including right beliefs about God and holy living before God. And so, for a lot of you, you are parents here, um, sometimes you look at your child and they have maybe a mark on them. They're often called, called birthmarks. So, I know a friend that has a large triangle shaped dark dark shape in the in his back since he was born and so there's just a birthmark and it's just very random marks on your body that you inherit from from birth and so if you look closely uh, like on the side of my ear there's a bump right there that I've always had I don't know why but it's just always been there and it's this kind of considered a birthmark as well and so and it's just, it's nothing wrong with it it's just always been there. And so, um, but when we talk about birthmark, we talk in, in the eyes of a Christian, in the eye, and when we talk about how God wants us to live as Christians, we ought to have certain birthmarks 
And we can substitute that word to characteristics of how we exhibit ourselves as children of God. It's very like, very often the case that children follow in the, in the footsteps of the parents. We often hear the statements, like father, like son, or she is just like her mother, referring to the daughter. In addition, it is also the case that children usually bear a striking resemblance to their mother, their father, or even both. Someone will say, well, their son's just a spitting image of their dad. He has their dad's eyes, nose, chin. And in my case, in the past, for whatever reason, my father would display my baby picture and my sister's baby picture. When they ask, oh, who are these two? And my dad would explain, oh, this is my son, this is my daughter. I thought they looked the same. Our baby pictures still look identical between me and my sister. For whatever reason, my, my father wanted to put that out there in our house for visitors to kind of guess that. But what it was is just the shape of our heads were very similar and between my, me and my sister when we were babies. And we got that from our dads. So that's, that's what it means when we talk about striking resemblance. But in this case to how we relate to God, we're not talking about the physical features of God because if we read in the Bible, God is spirit. We are made in the image of him. That image means his characteristics. And so <clears throat> people would compute. <laughs> so I read, read that. So, but again, when I talk about the, the case between me and my sister about how we resemble each other is a way of acknowledging our family resemblance or birthmarks that gives evidence of those to whom they belong to. In the letter of 1 John, the last living apostle has repeatedly drawn attention to three overarching birthmarks of the children of God. They are the right beliefs, the right kind of love, and the right behavior. Now in the scripture we're about to read, he is the author of First John is going to draw out necessary implications of these three birthmarks and highlight six specific identifying evidence that a person is a child of God. John wants true believers to be assured that they are children of God, and he is fully aware of the fact that they there are spiritual deceivers in the midst of who could raise questions and cast doubts. John wants believers to have a rock-solid assurance that they have been born again and that they belong to Jesus and that they can enjoy what is right now the eternal life, the gift of eternal life. So let's start there with verse 1. So we're going to the next slide. We're, just, we're going to start in verse 1 out of chapter 5. You read with me, please. And it says, out of 1 John chapter 5, verse 1, Everyone who believes that Jesus is the Christ is born, is, that Jesus is Christ, is the Christ is born of God. And any, everyone who loves the Father loves his child as well. So John raises the issue. We are reminded that true Christianity always comes back to Jesus. It's who he is and what we believe about him. John will begin and end with this section with, with this, to, to bring up this issue and to remind us of who, we, um, of who Jesus is. And John begins with an all-inclusive word, everyone, as it says in the in verse 1, no one is excluded. All must embrace and articulate the, the statement that follows. The word believes speaks of continuous action. Everyone who is believing is the idea. A Christian author says that the assurance of my salvation comes not from the fact that I did trust Christ, but I am trusting Christ for my salvation. And what must, we, what must we believe? We must believe that Jesus is the Messiah. We must believe, but also trust in the truth 
that Jesus of the Nazarene is the Messiah, the Christ, the hope for, and promised deliverer. Such a confession is a birthmark that we have been born of God and that we are children of God. Again, when we talk about birthmarks, in order to have this relationship with Christ, we have to be born again. The concept of being born again is dying from your old self so that you could be revealed as your new self in Christ. One of the, and one of the birthmarks that, that comes along with this is, is the confession that Christ is Lord and our Savior. And so, and with this, John will allude that the new birth, well, John alluded to the new birth three times in this verse. It is a theme he began back in chapter 2 and will complete it in, within chapter 5, this, uh, chapter 5 as well. There is little doubt that he got the idea from Jesus in John 3, where Jesus told a religious lead, leader by the name of Nicodemus, said to him, out of John 3, 3, he said, Unless someone is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. In these verses, John makes three observations about the new birth and the evidence related to this birthmark. First, those who have been born of God have given witness. Well, I'm sorry. First, those who have been born of God give witness concerning their new birth by confessing that Jesus is the Messiah. Second, those who have been born of God give witness concerning their new birth new birth by loving their father God and his, ch and his children. Third, those who have been born of God give witness concerning their new birth by continually overcoming the world. Being born of God is a biblical birthmark or description of a Christian. It is also des designated in scripture as being born again. It is not an option or a secondary experience for a, for, a for a child of God. It is essential and, and necessary. Jesus said in John 3, 7, you must be born again. To be a Christian is to be born again or born of God. If you have not been born again, you are not a Christian. However, if you will simply trust Jesus as your Messiah, believe in him to be the very son of God who lived the life that you should have lived but didn't, died to death but you should died to death that you should have died but did not have to, and was raised from the dead to give you a salvation you do not deserve. Being born of God and believing in Jesus is intertwined in the Bible and cannot be separated. With all this, he gives you a new nature. He gives you the very nature of God himself as you enter his family. Now, that's all out of verse 1. The verse 2, if we read on. Okay, so verse 2, it says, This is how we know that we love the children of God, by loving God and carrying out his commandments. In these two verses that we just read, verses 1 and 2, we see that our love for God is multidimensional. It's not just one way or just one very, at one simple aspect. It flows to the Father, but then it streams, it streams bunches out to different directions. The word love appears more than 30 times um, um, within 1 John chapter 4 and chapter 5. The new birth of regeneration brings us into a relationship with God as God as Father. This Father first loved us, and now we love him. For, he, for who he is and what he has done in us in Christ. However, we do not only love the Father, we also love the family, the family the Father is building. 
with other brothers and sisters that are born of him. But John then makes an interesting statement in verse 2 that is that is at first seems out of order. He says, we can know that we, we love God's children when we love God and obey his commands. Does it seem out of order? Shouldn't he be saying that we know we love God because we are his children? I think that John is pointing out that that within Jesus' teaching, there are two commands. As stated out of Matthew 22, verses 36 to 40, it says, my love for others is the natural component, natural component and, and companion to my first love for God. When I love God, I will keep his commandments. And keeping his commandments involve loving others, his brothers, his sisters, daughters, and sons in, in particular. Furthermore, verse 36, Three informs us the, that obeying the command to love one another will not be burdensome. It will be a joy and a delight because the new birth makes it a natural thing to do. And our love for the Father inspires us and motivates us to love those he loves and to love them as he loves us. John's argument was, has tremendous practical application. Because first, it will protect us from sentimental and emotional understandings of, of love that leaves God's character and commands, out of, and commands out of the picture. Meaning that the world has their view of what love is, but God, but God's stance on love is what he stands on. It is the standard that we need to, we need to up, try to up, uphold, to, uphold to. Second, because... My love for God, because my love for God guides my love for others, I will seek their ultimate good. Not in that which is temporal or passing. I will not seek to make others comfortable while neglecting their greatest need, which is eternal salvation in Christ. So this is something that a lot of us may have trouble with. We have friends that we see often they don't come to church, but they know you do. And so you try to make them feel comfortable around them and not try to be the guy that talks about God all the time because you don't want to make them feel out of place. But we have to consider that where they're at in life, is, it, is their life fulfilling to them? Is their life to whoever they Think is God fulfilling to them? Are they hurting inside? Are you that person to bring God to them? You will never know unless um, you are put in that position and then you see for yourself that you are needed. And that's when God uses you. But it's up to you to be obedient to that, to that call or not. And a lot of us sometimes would often not answer that call. So I want us to think about that too. Have we done that in our lives when we had opportunities to do, that, do it for others, especially our friends who, who don't know Christ? Okay. So just reading from uh, verse 2, now we're going to read in verse 3. In verse 3, it says, in fact, this is, in fact, this is love for God to keep his commands, and his commands are not burdensome. Let's just kind of explain that um, from what I read. So John returns to the theme of obedience to the command of God. Though he knew that loving God and obeying God was were distinguishable, he also knew that they were they were inseparable. So take, to, take this perspective of obedience into consideration. At the end of verse 3, where he says, God's commands are not a burden, how does that work, it, work itself out? John is saying that the new birth 
I receive a new nature. And with this new nature comes new affections, new passions, treasures, and values. Because I now love God instead of hating him. I treasure and value him above everyone else and everything else. And because I treasure and value him above everyone and everything else, I delight in obeying him. Now I find his commands not to be a burden, but a blessing. And this is evident if we dig into the book of Psalms. In the book of Psalms, we repeatedly find the joyful statements of regenerated hearts as they sing the heart sing their joy in doing the will of the Lord and obeying his commands. Let's take some examples. If you go to the next verse, the next slide. So I'll read them off. You don't have to go through there, but I'll read them off. Psalms 37, 4. Take delight in the Lord, and he will give you your heart's desire. Psalms 48. I delight to do your will, my God. Your instructions live within me. Psalms 112, verse 1. Hallelujah. Happy is the man who fears the Lord, taking great delight in his commands. Psalms 119, verse 14. I rejoice in the way revealed by your decrees as much as all your riches. And Psalms 119, 16. I will delight in your statues. I will not forget your word. You need to find ways of motivating yourself through the book, through the Bible. The book of Psalms is always a great place to start. And so, and so even though it's over 100, over, over 100, 120 chapters, I could be wrong. But it's a very easy read, and they're usually short in chapters. But it gives a lot of motivation and a lot of encouragement. So for those who may feel a little discouraged, Book of Psalms is always a great place to start to read. So with all that, an author by the name of Jerry Bridges says, love provides the motive for obeying the commands of the law, but the law provides specific direction for exercising love. Loving God rightly, therefore, is not an ex- uh, external behavior or outward behavior. Out of outward obedience, it is a longing to do his will from the heart, not out of gospel gratitude for who he is or what he has done in us in Jesus. It is not a I have to obedience. It is a I want to obedience. Uh, hopefully we can come out of this and know that when it comes to obeying our God, we can not want to say and say Outwardly saying that I want to obey the God because I love my God. Verse 4, you read along. <clears throat> Next slide. For everyone born of God overcomes the world. This is the victory that has overcome the world, even our faith. So the theme of verse 4 is made clear by by the repetition of the word conquer, or in this instance, uh, overcome. So, here in addition to love, the author points out to another spiritual weapon, weapon that grants us victory over the weapons of the world in our spiritual battles, which is our faith. There is a beautiful balance here. We're going to talk about these five verses. These five verses, if you're looking at it in depth, tells us how we can live life if we had doubts. Tells us how we can live in the Father if we had doubts. Tells us how we can reassure us that our faith faith is real if we had doubts. There's a balance in there within these five verses, as I said. And so, as we see John wets the new birth with our faith, when we talk about the new birth, that's God's sovereign work. In our faith, it's our human responsibility. You need to try to put that together. The world is no longer my passion. God is. I hope that would be the mentality when you come, when you 
come across this new birth of, that we experience and then within our, within our faith as well. Sinful desires and attractions are no longer beautiful. God and his will, his will are. Another author by the name of John Piper put it this way. Faith sees that Jesus is better. That is why faith conquers the world. The world held us in bondage by the powers of desire. But now our eyes have been opened to a new birth to see the superior desirability of Jesus. Jesus is better than the desires of the flesh and better than the desires of the eyes, and better than the riches that strangles us with greed and pride. Jesus is indeed superior, and faith is the victory that overcomes the world. Faith was at the beginning, and it is with us today, and it will be with us to the, to the end. Having faith is a distinguishing birthmark that you are a child of God. And lastly, verse 5. <clears throat> Turn to verse, verse 5. Uh, it says, who is it that overcomes the world? Only the one who believes that Jesus is the son of God. How reassuring is that? Because in verse 5, it says, who believes in Jesus, the son, son of God, understand that, says that this faith commitment is the means whereby they gain victory and overcome the world. Son of God is an important title for Jesus in the Bible. And it informs us that he is more than man. He is also God. He is, he is the God-man. His name, Jesus, identified him as a, as a man. But the word, the phrase son of God identifies him as God. He is both the nature of humanity as Jesus and the, and the nature of God as the son of God. He came from God and he is God. He is the eternal son who always has existed and always will exist as a second person of that to God. The birthmark of a child of God is that he believes that, that Jesus is the son of God. And it's the only way to get to, to God, God the Father. This believing, this faith is both particular and preserving. Jesus and only Jesus is the object of this faith confession. This confession is continuous and ongoing. The word believe is a present tense verb, noting, noting this continuous action, because it's not a one-time belief. It is a lifetime belief. It is personal and an individual belief. No one else can believe for me. No one else can believe for you. You must believe that the good news of the gospel for yourself. You must trust Jesus Christ, the Son of God, for yourself. And I'll end it here with our last verse. John chapter 3, verse 36. John chapter 3, verse 36. For it says... <clears throat> Whoever believes in the Son has eternal life, but whoever rejects the Son will not see life, for God's wrath remains on them. It's a stern warning, but, but from God, it is the truth. So, with all this being said, for those who have yet to come to, yet to know to come Christ, I would urge you, I would plead with you, even beg you, please choose Jesus. It will not just be your best life now, it will be your best life forever after life on earth. And so with that being said, it's just, hopefully when this study it just reminds us that we as children of God, we possess all these birthmarks, these characteristics of how we are children of God. By confession, 
by having the faith, by knowing that we're a part of the family, by believing that Jesus is Messiah, by obeying his commands, by knowing that we overcome the world as well. So please, I ask that you take this with you. Be reminded of it. Always pray upon it, meditate on it, and never forget it. So with that being said, I'm going to close this in prayer and we'll dismiss. Gracious Father, thank you again for allowing us to be here. Thank you for reminding us of what your disciple is, has been wanting to teach us out of 1 John. Thank you for inspiring um, the words that, that he wrote as these words were from you. I pray that we continue just to be, be diligent and thoughtful and in our everyday lives to always think of you and, and to hear from you, to hear your voice, to be obedient if you call to us. And so that's my prayer for all of us tonight. And so, and I want to give out my continuous prayers to those who aren't with us, uh, who couldn't be here for whatever reason. Um, pray for it, all the college students, the, the freshmen that are moving in. Um, it will be an exciting transition for them, but at the same time, I, I pray that, that, that the, the path before them will be the be um, be filled with righteousness for them, Father, and they they realize, they realize it. And so, um, let us be be aware of those who may deceive us. Be aware of those who may bring us down. May uh, might try to cast doubts uh, because of our faith and our belief. Let us be bold and be able to to stand firm for you. And I uh, just want to pray for. Also for a fundraiser for our youth this, this Saturday, pray that it goes well. Pray that uh, we be able to raise as much funds as possible to help help pay for most of the costs or even all of it, whatever may come. Um, pray for uh, Brother Chance as he's uh, out of town right now, and he'll be in Denver with the rest of the 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 people of Leaf uh, for the retreat. So. Uh, again, just want to uh, lift this up to you and continue to uh, uplift everyone here and bless us throughout this week. In Jesus' name, amen. Mm -hmm.